welcome all the uh, participants. A very simple topic today of examination of breast lump. You heard enough from uh, Madam Dr. Selvi about people who don't have a lump and we have a mammogram, ultrasound, some real excellent uh, informative pictures. I'm sure the PGs have benefited a lot from that uh, quantum of mammography and uh, ultrasound findings, extremely useful, right? Now, the, I'm coming down to much more mundane matters today. We're discussing a cancer which is supposed to be one of the most common cancers today. I think the overtaken carcinoma of cervix as the most common uh, malignant tumor in a female in this country. And what is uh, sort of uh, first thing we look at the age and what worries us is a more and more number of younger patients coming to us. Maybe changing the lifestyle because there's a time when Indians used to get married early, get pregnant early, a large family, and they used to breastfeed all the children. It's totally changed now. The age of marriage has become much later. The first uh, pregnancy also is delayed, and maximum they have two children. Maybe the hormonal imbalance might be one of the factors. We don't know. There's so many others. I don't go into genes, etc. But what worries about the age is that more and more younger patients are coming with breast cancer. As far as we are concerned today, we are looking at only those patients who come with lump as the presenting symptom. When they present the lump, what are the questions you're going to ask? One is the duration. Usually duration is measured in, measured in, quick, we need, quick, measured in, days, weeks, months, years. Months. Answer in your mouth. Simple question. There's no catch in this question. Don't expect catch months. in every question. These are straightforward questions. Months. Uh, months, that's right. Quite often, months. Right. What is interesting, <clears throat> is what brings the patient to the doctor is the rate of growth. The patient finds that the uh, <coughs> in there in the breast starts growing rapidly in size and that worries the patient. Because as I said earlier, there's hardly any pain. And I've said it Practically in every class, uh, the patient, patient tends to neglect painless swellings. But it's a rapid increase in size that brings the patient to the doctor more often. Pain, if at all they have, when there's a large tumor, they may complain of dragging pain. Unless there's an infected ulcer, they don't have pain. That's a what, unfortunately, is a fact. Next, a small number of patients come with discharge from the nipple. Having heard a Benign breast disease, may I know the most common cause for discharge from the nipple? Common yeah. cause, most common cause? Ductectasia. Okay, pardon? Ductectasia. Ductectasia. What kind of discharge you get in ductectasia? Greenish. 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 Okay, right, fine. Right. Whereas, in, suppose a patient comes to you with a bloodstream discharge, bright red blood, what condition do you think of? Interductal papilloma. That's papilloma. Now, at, the undergraduate, at undergraduate level, uh, I don't know, I said it earlier, undergraduate level, MBBS level, everything is black and white. When you come to for PG level, everything is which color? Gray. Gray. That's the whole problem. In MBBS level, you have a discharge, blood strain discharge, and a lump, you think of malignant. Your discharge without a lump, you think of duct papilloma. PG level is not that simple. You can have a malignant uh, tumor without a palpable lump and with a bloodstream discharge. How do you tackle a duct, a duct papilloma, please? Microdochectomy. Microdochectomy. Yeah. Loud, loud, loud. Come. Microdochectomy. Suppose they don't have, see, microdochectomy needs a operating microscope. Am I right? In a magnification. Okay. Suppose in a peripheral place you don't have that, will you send a patient or can you do something? Uh, which is not the ideal treatment, but see in India, some more often than not, we cannot do the best, we do the second best. There are many examples. Is there a second best? So I agree with you. Microdichotomy is the best question. Is there any other option? Oh, so, uh, yes, please. Headfields operation. Oh, Headfields. Big pardon? Headfields Head. operation. What is that? What do you do? Bone excision. Bonical excision. Conical excision of operation. How do you which cone to take out? How do you decide? 
excision of all the major ducts. Really? In fact, if you examine the patient carefully in bright light, ex ex apply a little pressure, you can see the particular duct opening with a drop of darkish blood appearing at that particular site. You can introduce a tiny little, uh, usually I use a lacrimal catheter, and inject a dye. Under local, you make a circumallocation incision along that particular quadrant. You can see the duct beautifully, which is strained with the dye you injected. You can excise the duct and these patients are permanently ill. You don't have to take out a cone. This is an operation which is within the capacity of most general surgeons. Okay, right. Now, the skin changes I'll, I'll give in detail when uh, we discuss the inspection part of it. But patients, more often than not in this country, come with major skin changes or even ulceration. A point of importance here, many at the rural level, when there's a lump in the breast, they tend to apply some counter irritants. Ulceration may be to counter irritants. Next question, can a benign tumor cause an ulcer in the breast? Can a benign, yes? Yes, that's all. Loud, loud, loud. Yes, Pilots. Pilots. I beg your pardon? Pilots tumor. Pilots tumor. Why does ulceration take place? Necrosis of the summit. Necrosis of the? Summit. Of what? Because of the large tumor going through. This is stretching of the skin, sir. That's right. So, what happens? Uh, you give the key word there. Pressure necrosis. Exactly. So, this is an example. Uh, see, more often in other parts of the body, an ulcerated tumor is taken as malignant. Am I right? If you find a soft tissue sarcoma or something else, ulcerates, the moment you see an ulcer, you do not think of benign tumor. Straight away, your mind goes to malignancy. But here's one example. In parotid, we discuss a benign tumor recurring again and again, remaining benign until at a late stage become malignant. Here we are talking of a benign tumor with an ulcer. Then how do we distinguish this ulcer from that of a malignant infiltration of the skin? Clinically, don't tell me about skin stories. Clinically, is it possible to distinguish an ulcer? Okay, we'll come to that during palpation. Okay, we'll come to that later. A last group, common. these are patients who may come to you after undergoing treatment for the primary in the exam, where they may have secondary symptoms due to metastasis in the liver or in the lung or in the bone. So these are invariably, they had some treatment earlier and they would come to you only after the primary has been treated properly. Now, this is a small point. I'm sure all of you know about it. My family history is important because family history is important because simple yes. 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 I know, probably you know more than there is a recent genetics are concerned regarding cousin of breast. Okay. So I ask about menstrual history. So duration of exposure of estrogen. Yeah, very good. How do you classify them? Early menopause. Early menopause. Late menopause. Late menopause. Okay, fine. Obstetrical history is important because I said earlier. Age at first childbirth. Chance of malignancy are less. But you find one, one group of patients, usually elderly, despite having had a large family, these people develop a cancer, come to us a little later. But keep the point, there's an elderly group, despite having a large family, still develop carcinoma breast at a rather late age compared to the rest of the population. Now this point, last point, is very important. More often than not, in this country, patients tend to come late. One reason I already said, because it's painless. Is there any other reason? Is there any other reason for patients reporting to doctors late in the course of the disease? The reason is innate shyness. Innate shyness on the part of the patient exposed the breast. 
That's why most of them land up with lady doctors, though they may not be surgeons. A large number of uh, breast cancer cases are seen by gynecologists and then referred, of course. If some of you end up in the United States, what do you find? The gynecologists do breast surgery also. Breast cancer surgeons and should have, of course, we got a breed of new of breast surgeons only that is possible in uh, large metros. When you work in a smaller place, I don't you can confine yourself and say I'm only a breast surgeon. It's not viable. But there is a delay because patients have innate uh, shyness to expose the breast and get examined, especially by male doctors. I don't know how many of you have just out of curiosity, I mean, as a historic information. Uh, in the 1950s, for the first time, in Victoria Hospital, no, no, Vani Villas Hospital, Bangalore, so women doctors, <coughs> doctors appointed as a gynecologist, and the whole Bangalore public uh, were saying, how can a male doctor be a gynecologist? Things have changed a lot during the last seven decades. Now we come to local examination. Point number one, you have got to get the entire upper chest exposed, easier said than done, especially in younger women. You've got to have both the breasts for comparison. Now, what are the things you're going to look for? Have good light, make the patient initially sit up, you may have to make her lie down during some stage, and examine both the breasts. The first thing that is noticeable is a change in the contour. So really fatty breast, when the lump is comparatively small, you may not be able to make out the lump properly then the correct word to use in the description is a fullness, where the margins are not very clear. I'll show you a picture. If you look at this picture, there's an obvious fullness, but you can't make out the borders, etc. So you call it a full, the term used is a fullness. Most of them have a visible lump. Once you <coughs> you've got to find out where is it located. You divide the breast into four quadrants by by yes two vertical and two horizontal and crossing passing through nipple passing through the nipple nipple, nipple. that's right very good excellent so why is it important why is the location the quadrant involved is so certain not? diseases are more common in certain quadrants right very good anything more than that surgical plan Okay, one more point. Lymphatic drainage. Lymphatic drainage. We'll come to that a little later. And you agree, one more point. Muscles and all the things. change with reference to the quadrant. Upper outer is having more chance of carcinoma as any other quadrant. And good, and they do better than the worst quadrant is. Lower inner. Upper inner. Lower inner. Lower inner. Lower inner. Inner half. Risk of internal mammary drainage is more. more. Lower inner quadrant, we learn a little later. Another method of spread of the tumor also is known to occur. So therefore, once you have a size, size, uh, I did some personal work in this direction. You may be surprised to hear that the 60s and 70s, when I started uh, my practice, the average size was 5 centimeters. Later on, it's come down to 3 centimeters because this is urban population. Village population, even now, comes with it depends on the level of education. And remote villages far away, they tend to wait until the tumor really reaches a large size. But remember, the largest size tumors in the breast are benign. Benign. Name them. Fibrous tumor. That's Fylodes. right. Fylodes. Before ulceration, fibrous tumor could be some of the largest. What are other causes of? Uh, uh, increase in the size of the breast. The, you have heard a benign disease just now. Just repetition. Come on. Main hypertrophy of the breast. Yes, agreed. <clears throat> Gi giant fibroadenoma. Okay, fine. That's what you are saying. Fluids almost there's very little difference. Fine. Then you make out the margins, the thin breast, superficial tumors, you may be able to make out the margins well. Fatty breast, deeply located tumors, margins may be indistinct. Understand that? Then you come to skin over the swelling. There are lots of changes in the skin. Uh, first of all, the word about dilated veins. Please remember, in fair women, 
a couple of veins are visible even in a normal person. Just because you see a dilated vein, straight away don't jump to conclusion that there is a abnormality. We are talking about a patient who got a lump and dilated vein that is definitely significant. The first change that occurs is stretched. When the skin gets stretched, it becomes shiny. You see this picture? In fact, this is an inflammatory carcinoma, but you can make out the shiny skin because of the rapid stretching of the skin, it's pretty shiny skin. Later on, you get erythema. Same picture will show you erythema as well. The whole thing is very angry red, you can make out. Later on, you get dimpling. When does dimpling occur? One particular spot, it appears to be pulled inside. What's the cause of dimpling? Cooper's ligament. Cooper's ligament. from... Cooper's ligament extends from... So from the substance of breast up to the... skin to the pectoral Skin under Where does it start in substance of the breast, my dear young man? Superficial part of deep fascia to the superficial fascia. Part of the deep fascia. Where is the deep fascia? Breast is in which anatomical plane? I thought I'll come Superficial plane. Later. Superficial. No, you can't call it, madam. Planes are called skin subcutaneous. 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 Uh, subcutaneous. So you're talking of a fascia. Goodness gracious me. Don't tell me. Don't know about Cooper's ligament. Sir Ashley Cooper he has described so many things. You heard of Cooper's ligament anywhere else? Or just out of curiosity? Inguinal. 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 Okay, probably better informed about hernia than the breast. Anyhow, Cooper's ligaments extend from the skin down to the pectoral fascia. You have to imagine them as three-dimensional structures. In fact, these are ligaments which divide the breast into various lobules. Understand that? The, the lobulation varies, 16 or 18 lobules. They're all separated from each other by a, a three-dimensional structure called the pectoral <coughs> ligament. So when the Cooper ligament gets involved, you get deep one particular spot, the skin appears dimpled. Suppose more than uh, one neighboring Cooper ligaments are involved, what do you get? You get puckering. 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 pictures a little later, understand? So single Cooper's ligament leads to dimpling. Multiple Cooper ligament leads to puckering. Most of our patients, present with either dimpling or puckering because skin involvement occurs in the vast majority of patients by the time they reach the hospital. Then the next thing is something very, very familiar. I'll show you a picture. This is an exaggerated picture of a pretty orange caused by, caused by... Blockage of the dermal lymphatic. Sub lymphatic. Sub -dermal are you aware of any non-malignant condition get Mondos, Mondos disease. Mondos disease produced localized. You don't get uh, this Breast kind of. Beg your pardon? Breast. Breast. Abscess. Abscess. No. Of course, this is a condition probably most of you are, uh, have not Maybe. seen. But uh, being in this country, I think you ought to be aware of this, especially in certain parts of the country. I can't give any more clues. I'm talking of filarial breast. Areas where filarial is endemic. In fact, the best body orange is seen in filarial breast. They cause gross enlargement due to deposition of uh, fibrosis and uh, lymphatic tissue in the subcutaneous because the lymphatic blockage. Breast itself is normal. They put your mammogram. The manogram, but the gentleman will say there's no change in the breast, but it is an accumulation of material in the subcutaneous tissue. And filar breast produces a picture which is much more clear compared to malignancy. Understand that? So, so because the PG exam, you may be asked this kind of questions. Does a, a body orange always mean malignant? Answer is 99.99%, right? But there are occasions where a filar breast invariably associated with uh, massive erythema. But what surprises you is when you go and palpate, you can hardly make out a lump because the entire pathology is confined to, to the skin and subcutaneous tissue. 
due to that, the gland remains essentially normal. The, the last change that you look for in the, not the last loss, but one, skin nodules. How do they occur? What is the, the process behind which skin nodules occur in calcium of breast? Come on. You do see them in this country, still you will see this kind of patient presenting your skin nodules, body orange, dimpling, puckering, this or that. Satellite metastasis. Beg your pardon? Satellite metastasis. Satellite metastasis is a beautiful word, but can you explain it further? One thing I'm happy, a lot more people are opening up their mouths, I'm very happy. Otherwise, it becomes harikata. We are, Missy are right, satellite nodules, mm. explain the, it's obviously take a biopsy, is malignant. Agreed? Agreed, yes, no? Uh, how yes. does malignant cells reach the skin? You got to move one step ahead of Purdy orange. There, the dermal lymphatics are only blocked. Here, no. tumor cells the grow in retrograde, retrograde direction, retrograde direction along the lymphatics to reach the skin. That means the late sign. You see this in one other disease, namely the lady who said satellite nodules should know the answer. Melanoma. Melanoma. Same thing. Same pathology. The tumor cells go in a retrograde direction to produce skin nodules in carcinoma breast. Of course, the last change is an ulcer. As I said earlier, ulcer in this country may be due to a application of counter irritants. Understand? And the uh, last change, I've seen only two patients my entire career is cancer in cuirassia. What does cuirassia mean? Armor chest. Armor, armor. armor, armor chest. Armor. armor chest. I'm sorry. Armor. There are a couple of, uh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Now you look at this ulcer and look at this ulcer. Those who heard me on the first day will straight away give the answer. I'll go back again. Look at this ulcer. Look at this ulcer. Those who heard me on the first day, if there's anybody, there's nobody, I'll give the answer. Sir, one is ulcerative, one is proliferative. Fungating and one is ulcerative. This is known as excavating type of ulcer, where the floor is at a lower level compared to the edges. Can you make out the raised uh, edges, mm. uh, especially on yes, the, 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 the nipple? Are you able to appreciate that? Raised, inverted edges, but the floor itself is down in the depth. Whereas in the next ulcer, you find the whole thing is proliferative. And what is the white area? Necros uh, slough. Necrosis. Slough. Why does necrosis occur? It, in it is blood supply. supply to the center. Despite new vasculogenesis, you find the tumor cells are growing such a rapid rate. And, the, and what happens this is a surface lesion. Therefore, the additional element of, of infection the bacteria thrive on the mm. dead malignant tissue and that's why the surface malignancies you find an ulceration associated with false malignant discharge because the additional bacterial infection at that state as i mentioned about 10 minutes earlier you may have some pain as a symptom otherwise you do not find pain but this is a cancer in curiosity extremely uncommon today but the whole thing from breast down to the chest wall becomes one solid mass. It resembles an armor. The whole breast is involved and it completely stuck the chest wall. That we'll find out later during palpation. Now we come to the nipple areola complex. The most common finding is a retracted nipple. All of you seen retracted nipple. But the question is, why does it occur? Due to infiltration of the lactiferous duct. Infiltration of the duct. Uh, I would accept this answer, but in reality, work done shows that it is the infiltration, the periductal lymphatics. Most examiners will accept the ductal involvement, but please remember, spreading from one duct to another occurs rather late in the disease. But periductal lymphatics are involved very early. Duct, your answer as ductal involvement will take you across the exam hurdles, no question at all. But if you dig a little deeper, it is periductal lymphatic infiltration that pulls the nipple inside. Uh, what are the other conditions that pre retracted nipple? Having heard the disease. Duct ectasia. Common. Duct ectasia. Papre. 
common congenital congenital excellent very good how do you make it out circumferential you always bilateral bilateral always so therefore the statement is single retraction on one side of recent origin is sinister please remember that stress on the word single stress on the word recent origin inflammatory diseases etc produce retraction over a long period of time so retracted nipple you can say ductal involvement you can say periorectal lymphatic both are accepted then you get if there is a tumor extend is superior region i'll show a picture and that shows uh, uh, see look at this now here you can make out the puckering can you see the skin creases being drawn inside on either side is it visible please yes sir yes, yeah. you see the pigmented area and you go around the same amount of podi orange you can make out in addition to that you can see those something like transverse lines that indicate the puckering so puckering therefore is due to involvement of more than one uh, ligament cooper's ligament uh, cooper's right okay fine so occasionally this something which most people uh, do not look for a subarachnoid tumor can cause an enlargement in size of the areola the uncommon finding but when present it indicates that tumor is extended very well into the sub area of complex the last one is pages disease benign pre malignant malignant benign pre malignant 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 pre malignant yes please pre malignant 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 everybody say malignant no obviously yes, malignant the uh, 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 idea it's a pre malignant lesion has gone forever now there are two pictures of uh, ulceration and what happens is the ductal neoplasm spreads out to involve the nipple what is it called by any other term because if you uh, apply a little pressure you find a bits of tumor tissue come out through the duct opening that's why they are known as is a beautiful word to describe this tumors starts with the english letter c second letter is o come on come on i'm toker doing... toker sir c o i said these are known as comedo carcinoma that's the key word comedo carcinoma is a key word so you got to look at the area nipple complex carefully look for puckering look for subarachnoid and retracted nipple is extremely common and if you are lucky enough you may find other changes now you come to palpation as i said in very first class large lumps if you keep your palm over the lump for a couple of minutes so spread of the warmth is much better appreciated compared to the back of the fingers the method which i have identified i have found it useful those who have not heard this please go back if you have got a very superficial accessible lump keep the palm over the lump for a couple of minutes spread of warmth is much better appreciated most are not tender unless there's an infective element now you come to consistency please remember in the thyroid as well as in the breast is a change in consistency that makes you to identify a lump or a there you call it a nodule compared to the surrounding breast tissue you find that this is invariably hard but problem <coughs> is soft which are the soft tumors malignant tumors soft malignant tumors medullary carcinoma one good number two Agreed. Yes. Mucinous. Huh? Mucinous. Mucinous. Right. Mucinous. That's right. Colloid or mucinous carcinomas and uh, medullary carcinoma are soft in consistency, but even them you can differentiate this from the surrounding fat. Understand that it is possible. It's not as in the thyroid papillary carcinoma to distinguish from the healthy surrounding. Uh, tissue as far as consistency is concerned extremely difficult especially when the cancer is deep located but in the breast even when they are soft the consistency is different from the surrounding fat so you can easily identify these lump despite their consistency being soft understand that now we come to mobility and anatomical plane first is skin majority of patients come with skin already fixed why skin fixity important 
change the stage. Staging, staging, of the staging one, staging. number two, treatment modalities, which I'm not going to discuss today. Teaching modalities also will have an influence. So skin fixity. Now, next is what distinguishes a malignant tumor, that is a breast tissue. What happens in benign disease? What happens in malignant disease? Malignancy, uh, the tumor is fixed to the breast tissue. Always. How do you find out? Put the breast in one hand and try to move the tumor. And I am sure you heard this fibroadenomas are supposed to be breast mobile. 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 A word of mobile. caution. A word of caution. Many, many students have got a habit of picking up certain words and sticking onto them throughout their lifetime. One such word is a breast mouse. When is the breast mouse fits the description of a benign tumor? Describe the, as a PG, describe the full circumstance. Under what circumstances you are permitted to use the word breast mouse? Come on, quick. All fibroadenoma. All fibroadenoma. That's a broad answer. We'll accept it at the MBBS level, not at the PG level. Not fixed to breast parenchyma. When you have a small, hard fibroadenoma in a compared to a large, fatty breast, if you're able to push that over a long distance, then and then only the word breast mouse is used. Understand that? If there is a large fibroadenoma occupying the entire breast, I would rather use the word bandicoot and not a mouse. You have seen bandicoots, no? You understand the point I'm trying to tell you? Because yes. Use the yes, breast sir. mouse, don't get in trouble. If you don't use the breast mouse, well and good. As I said, I don't know, maybe first or second class, some of these words catch your attention. Eggshell crackling, uh, snowfall, a snowstorm appearance. This is nice to hear, but you don't know when to apply them properly. So don't use the breast mouse, the word breast, better avoid it. But if it comes out of your mouth, you've got to justify it by saying, and the fibroidism is complex of the heart variety and it small. occupies a small area of the breast. In a fatty breast, you're able to push it to a long distance. Then only, and then only the word breast mouse can be applied, not otherwise. Understand? <coughs> is there any non malignant condition where the lump is fixed to the breast? Fibroidosis. I didn't hear. What did you say? Fibroadenosis. Fibroadenosis. That is, uh, uh, well, the, there what happens is the size of tumor is pretty small. For a nodular breast, which is uniformly spread, I want a single lump of considerable size, which in the, in the days gone by was unfortunately... Traumatic fat necrosis. I didn't hear. Traumatic fat, fat necrosis. Traumatic fat necrosis is a theoretical condition. It is much, much, much less common than what you see. Understand that? And usually history is... Uh, you are, if one, uh, I would agree with you on one point. Many of them may not give a history of a trauma. To that extent, I agree. But there's a condition which is a little more common. I agree with trauma. Antibioma. Antibioma is the answer. That's right. Especially with doctors in a non lactating lady, an antibioma is a a clinically fixed to the breast tissue. Of course, today I've got imaging uh, techniques which will distinguish you. Olden days, we used to put a needle. Before FNAC came, we, I myself were excised, telling the patient and relatives probably is malignant. And they're the happiest people who have come out of the OT and said this is a totally harmless condition. They're the happiest people. Those days are gone forever. With the imaging techniques today, you don't even need to do an FNAC. Okay, you just now heard uh, benign breast disease. What is the appearance of a traumatic fat necrosis on ultrasound? What is the appearance of a traumatic fat necrosis on ultrasound? Come on. Rest with Madam breast. Selby must have shown it. <laughs> I didn't hear. Breast I didn't. Uh, sorry, I'm an old man. You must talk to me a little breast louder. Breast within breast appearance. Huh? Breast within a breast appearance. Breast. That means it's the same normal breast parenchyma. Same thing, is it? So you find a, uh, just a line separating the two. Huh? Irregular equidinacity. Irregular. Goodness gracious me! No, I won't tell the answer. Go and find out. 
I won't tell you the answer. You heard two days of Madam Dr. Selvi talking so much about mammograms and ultrasound. And an hour Japanese later, you heard about huh? temporal special. What is, I didn't hear. It's classical. In fact, it's an ultrasound. It's a delight to see a traumatic heart necrosis and ultrasound. And repeat scans will show that it over a period of time it involutes. They most often do not need any treatment. Once ultrasound has come, nobody looks even FNAC is not needed. You have got a provided a dedicated ultrasoundologist. He can he or she can follow up the condition and show that the whole thing involutes. Please read the go back and open your textbooks and read about the ultrasound appearance of a traumatic. I'm not going to tell you. I'm sorry. Fixed with pectoralis major, all of you know uh, the test to be done. Now, my, I've got a question. Can a tumor of the breast be not fixed to the pectoralis major but still fixed to the chest wall? Is it possible? Not possible. Yes. Sir, it is anterior muscle. Beg your pardon? Possible. 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 Tumor of the axillary tail of spins. I'm not talking axillary tail is deep to the deep fascia. Please remember Inferior that. part of the breast. Inferior. Can you add a little more? Inferior, inferior part of the breast. Inferior quadrant. Serratus anterior is inferior. one. Any other, any other muscle? Any other fascia? Any other so, muscle? Superior oblique. Breast. Superior oblique. External oblique is one and anterior sheet. In fact, days gone by when we were doing Halster's radical mastectomy, the removal of the anterior sheath was part of the operation. So, if a tumor is occupying the inferior medial quadrant, chances are you can get fixed to the chest wall without the pectoralis major. Why I'm saying this is the moment you find out it's not fixed to uh, pectoralis major, don't stop there. Try to see. Uh, it happens uncommonly that the tumor is uh, starting from the inferior quadrant and extending. The rest of it, the tumor moves something like a pendulum. You understand what I mean? It's fixed at one or two points. The rest of it is mobile. And you tend to believe that it's not fixed to the underlying muscle. So be careful when tumors extend to the lower inner quadrant. Remember the serrated anterior as well as the anterior sheath and a portion of the external oblique all form the structures deep to... I got a picture. I'm sorry. I should show this picture to you. Can you look at this picture? Spectral is major upper part, and you see some thin muscles lower down. So imagine bring that blue down to the lower lobules. You can easily make out that, that it's not attached to spectral is major because it's attached to other muscles. Then, of course, we examine for additional lumps. Uh, we heard uh, Dr. Jacob, I'm sure the commonest condition for these multiple lumps are. The commonest condition producing multiple lumps in the same breast are fibroadenosis. Fibroadenosis is agreed. And then next common lobular carcinoma. Lobular carcinoma. Why? Because they can be multi bilateral, multifocal, multicentric. Agreed. So I palpate the rest of the breast because what happens is there's what is called as tangent, tangential thinking in the PG level. You pick up one or two findings and build up the whole superstructure. I mentioned this earlier, I repeat again. Get into the habit of getting all the findings before you think of the diagnosis. Don't jump to diagnose by uh, getting one or two clinical findings. So, therefore, once you get that lump, don't be happy. Palpate the rest of the breast carefully, additionally. And then, of course, during palpation, look for a discharge from the nipple. Discard more often in books, not often seen in practice. Then we go on to palpation the axilla. There's a little, uh, what should I say, defect in the methodology. Can somebody describe to me how do you palpate the axilla? It's pure undergraduate stuff, but better to get your fundamentals right. Come around, come on, quick. Come around, quick. Sir, uh, supporting the hand and uh, with the uh, under the same hand. Yeah, the your starting point is wrong. I'm sorry. You have got to use your hand for palpation. I agree with you. But the way Sir, you described is wrong. So we need to stabilize the shoulder of the patient. Stabilize, the shoulder. stabilize the shoulder. So, uh -huh. what, 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 what's the position of the shoulder? The patient is sitting. What's the position of the shoulder? The thing with the arms patient is sitting upright. Agree. If it is right. the right axilla, 
Mm. If it is the right axilla, the doctor needs to keep his right hand on the right shoulder so that the patient right doesn't shrug his shoulder above. Right axilla on the left yes. shoulder. Right axilla, the doctor's left shoulder. Now, the, the, all of you are on the right path, but the initial step, initial step, I'm not very happy. Stand in you front of the, the patient. What you have to do initially is hyper Remember, actually, hyper the, core. the deeper you go, the space becomes narrower. Therefore, initially, hyper abduct the shoulder, then introduce your opposite. If you're examining the right axilla, use the left hand and push it as deep as possible into the axilla, and then bring the shoulder down, whole limb down. Make the patient forearm rest on your own hand. Why? Why? To relax the muscle. To relax to the axillary fascia. Which, mus which muscle? Which muscle? Pectoralis minor. Pectoralis minor. My God. There are a couple of girls saying fascia. They are right. Please remember axillary fascia, like the fascia lateral of the thigh, is a tough fascia. Understand that? So a tough fascia makes palpation structures deep to it rather difficult. So when you adduct the shoulder, so it almost comes, in fact, there's only space for your hand between the shoulder and the trunk. At that stage, the axillary fascia is relaxed, and then you're able to palpate. Despite that, chances of missing a node in the axilla are pretty high, because especially in fatty women, there's so much of fat. You know those consistency can be different, but chance of missing. That's why today you depend upon so no, no, no. ultrasound to make out. They pick up more than come on, any figures you have <coughs> compared to the hand and the ultrasound. Ultrasound is better percentage wise. Anybody has figures? 90%. 90? 80%. No. You're going to be 60 ultrasound. 60 to 70%. 80%. 60 to 70 right. If there were 30% more notes are uh, seen by the ultrasoundist compared to the palpatory hand. So I repeat again, this is a mistake commonly done in the exam. Initially, hyper adduct the shoulder and then introduce your uh, hand, fingers especially, as deep into the axilla as possible. Bring the limb down, make the forearm rest, relax axilla fascia, and then palpate. A word of caution, many clinical books talk about the apical node. Where is the apical node located? Where is it? Supraclavicular. Supraclavicular. How do you how do you feel it? How do you feel it? Towards the apex of the like abduction. How do you it said that at least the classical book is to describe that? Introduce two fingers behind the middle third of the clavicle. Introduce your fingers as deep into the axilla. Uh, I am using the same words as the book. A sense of resistance well between the two nodes is an indirect evidence of the apical node. Look at the number of words. Sense of resistance. So in the exam, never, never, never talk about the apical node. What you're feeling are only belong to the pectoral and the central group. Of course, posterior group is usually not palpable. But never talk about the apical node. Clinically impossible to feel the apical node. Don't open your mouth as the apical node is concerned. Then, of course, examine the opposite. Uh, I'm sorry, palpate the supraclavicular fossa for for the lymph node. Now, word of caution: in patients who come with advanced malignancy, it's more often seen in carcinoma stomach. But I want to stress this point: the node is more Infra or retroclavicular than supraclavicular. You've got to insert your, you've got to stand behind the patient, insert your fingers deep to the clavicle between the between the sternal mastoid. It's a classical fructose node in carcinoma stoma. But you've got to extend even more lateral. Don't take on find yourself. Point I may uh, I want to impress upon you. It may not be supra in all circumstances. It may be retro or even infra. So, in fact, my experience is the one note PG is missed most often in the neck is level four. I don't know how many Saturday I saw one of my students, couple of my students named, they would remember 
Saturday morning clinic. The one note they used to miss left and right were the level four notes because you tend to become complacent. Please remember the degree of efficiency must be from point one to the last point the same. Don't ever, I got a lump, beautiful lump, I can discover the lump, don't get away. Every step examination must be done with the same degree of care. So the one point I'm again and again pressing, level four is the commonest mode missed by an ordinary postgraduate student. I'm not insulting you, I'm just stating you facts. Right. Then you go to the opposite breast. Why palpate the opposite breast? Nobular cast. Contral ventral malignant. Nobular cast. Bilateral. Okay. Any other condition rare? Any other condition rare? I've seen only two in my own lifetime. Nobular cast. Beautiful answer. Any other condition rare? I said I've seen only two. BRT. What is that? Bilateral synchronous carcinoma breast. How do you prove that they are synchronous carcinoma, not metastatic? Allergy. The pathology must be different. Now, if a patient has a metastatic lesion, how does the tumor spread from one breast to another? Here. Do lymphatic drain the drain the breast parenchyma communicate each other? I want to an answer yes or no. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Absolutely. No. The midline decussation of lymphatic, sir. Please remember, it's the skin lymphatic that cross over to the opposite side. That's the reason no. why I make an incision for MRM. You are advised never to cross the midline. You may cut across lymphatic going to the opposite side and create more problems. Skin. Lymphatic drain the skin over the breast communicates. So unless the skin is involved, chances are the patient has a metastasis of a primary, I mean, not a metastasis, primary tumor. So involvement of the skin makes it possible for a cancer breast to spread from one side to another. Please remember that. Examine the opposite axilla. Why? Opposite axilla. Why? Metastasis. Aging changes. Metastasis. How do tumor spreads from? Uh, I'm given a clinical scenario. Patient has a large lump, uh, same side, uh, ipsilateral axilla, a lot of lymph nodes, opposite axilla, a single lymph node. Nothing in the breast. Nothing in the breast. Breast is normal. Even ultrasound, mammogram, everything, breast is normal. Quickly answer that. Time is coming up. I didn't hear. I said breast is normal, proved on mammogram, proved on ultrasound, everything. MR, everything done, breast is normal. But there's a node of the opposite axilla. Put a needle, comes as malignant. Come on, explain. Quick, time is running up. Carcinoma in situ. Carcinoma? In situ. My dear girl, I'm talking lymph node. Occult. Carcinoma Occult. in situ and lymph I'm talking opposite ax uh, axilla. It's considered M. So from M. right side, M. supraclavicular, huh? it can go from the right side if the supraclavicular is involved. Uh -huh. and it can go to the left side Fantastic. as a retrograde. No very good. Very excellent answer because I always say that postgraduates are the most fertile imagination. The perfect <laughs> example of fertile imagination used by post. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations. The answer is Internal memory nodes communicate each other. The so right internal memory goes to left internal memory. Retrograde spread from the internal memory can reach the axilla, bypassing the breast in total. Please remember this. Understand? Because if you have a node and you prove it is malignant, straight away you go into M stage. Am I right? Am I right? Yes. That's the reason yes, why opposite axilla must be helped with the same degree of care. Because, see, I read some books, I read some articles where they say internal memory nodes are palpable. In my entire lifetime, I've never been able to feel an internal memory node. I'm very honest with you. Understand that? Then, if the opposite axilla shows your business is to go to the opposite spread clavicular, before you go on to distal spread, uh, one uh, word I should mention about the lymphedema. You must look at the upper limb for evidence of lymphedema. These are only operative cases if you get in the exam. As a primary tumor, I have seen maybe I can count in the fingers of one hand number of patients who come with late stage carcinoma breast. 
can you hear me? Because yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. There's a warning sign, internet is unstable. That's like telling me that I must close the discussion early. And yeah, right. So remember that lymphedema as a primary associate with a malignant tumor is uncommon. Operative cases or irradiated cases to get lymphedema. So look for lymphedema arm, which completes examination. Then we're expected to uh, examine the chest. Uh, I would stress only on one point. What's the commonest uh, lesion inside the chest cavity associated with breast cancers? Uh, good, very good. Excellent answer. How does uh, uh, how, what's the cause for pleural effusion? What's the mode of spread? Is it hematogenous spread from the lung the onto the pleura? Huh? Hematogenous. Hematogenous. That's what I'm saying. So you are, you are now talking of exclusive uh, blood supply to the pleura bypassing the lung. Uh -huh. I can understand the... To lymphatics. Ah, that's the answer. What do you call those lymphatics? What's the term used? Quick, quick, quick. Time is running out. The subpleural lymphatics are the mode of spread. That's why a patient with carcinoma breast on the right side can present in the left pleural effusion. Subpleural lymphatics communicate freely with each other. Somebody is talking of jump from the left supracular right. This jump is much more often seen. Understand? Then when we talked about supracular jump across the midline structures, visceral compartment. Now, here is a subtle lymphitis communicate. Therefore, one side breast cancer can produce pleural effusion on the opposite side. Then, of course, you can get second is the lung at a later stage. Abdomen, one word of, uh, you know, which is more wise. There's a lymphatic spread to the liver. Can somebody explain this? Diaphragmatic yeah. lymphatic. From the diaphragm. No, no, your starting point is wrong, madam. We are all midway. Through the lymphatic present near the rectus sheath. Rectus sheath. No, no, you are starting. Through, 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 through the umbilicus and through the ligamentum no, teres to the liver. That's a roundabout route. There's a much more direct route, lymphatic route we are talking about. Your starting point is wrong. All of you are right. When a tumor is occupying the lower inner quadrant, inner quadrant. lymphatics during the lower inner quadrant communicate with lymphatics under the rectus sheath. They communicate with the subpleural lymphatics. Then what happens? Then what happens? There's a key word to be used at this stage. Subdiaphragmatic Sub lymphatics. Excellent. Somebody gave that answer, I suppose. Yeah, I heard transylomic, right? No? Say yes, young man. Transylomic yes, spread. So they are supposed to drop down to the liver transylomically. They can drop down to peripheral cavity. But my own mind is more often than not in carcinoma breast. Beautiful picture in DAS. All these descriptions are given. But practical experience tells me that more often than not, because you see them at a much later stage of disease when the primary has been treated, quite often controlled to some extent, they come back with secondary liver. More often than not, if you do a technician scan, etc., you will find evidence of disease elsewhere indicating that the liver spread is due to hematidin. Last word is spine. Only one word of caution here. Which is a which part of spine is most often lumbar, 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 L2, T, yeah, I mean T12, L1 are the two are most often. Yeah, work, sir, huh? sir, the thoracic, the lower thoracic is most common, sir, compared to lumbar. The is more, therefore, minor uh, trauma and minor bleeds. They act as a focus for malignant cells or tubercle bacteria to get a position. Understand that? It's one of the most mobile portions of the spine, and minor trauma can lead to small bleeds. And these areas of hemorrhage act as an idas for either malignant cells or let us stop at this stage because I don't know, I don't think uh, we'll go on to TNM, etc. I'm sure we are all experts in this. Uh, I, I, I want you to do something. Saturday, I'm supposed to talk on TAO at the same time. I want you people to read 
let us have a five minutes question session and then go on with my own slides. Is it okay? Is yes, it okay sir. for you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Very good. I want a bold yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Now, thanks, Dr. Radha Krishnan, for a. Which topic, yes, sir? sir? Topic, sir. Topic. A O. P A O. I suppose you heard A O, no? Radha Krishnan is a Latin word. <laughs> Burgess disease. It's an English word or Latin Burgess word? Burgess disease, yeah. If I said Burgess disease, yes. It's a German word. No. But no, TAO is something. Okay, we'll talk about TAO. I think we'll have a say. Uh, you don't mind, no, Radha Krishna? One such small uh, question session. Yes, yeah, sure, sir. You have time. There's no limit now. Okay, right. Fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank I you, think today's session is over. Thank you. Right. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir.